So we've encompassed this idea of what we call 10 minute neighbourhoods. That within 10 minutes of where you live, you should be able to access a basic range of services and facilities. Yeah. I'm James Lowe, um, I'm from Hook. My question is with the 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute cities, whatever you call them, will this council commit to not using that planning aspect for, uh, uh, what is it, climate control by locking us away? It is um, the... Will you commit to not using it as a form of control? It is no form of control. It is actually part of the planning scheme and making sure that residents actually have access to services in the areas that they live. That so it's not question. about being locked away at my all. My question was... So this, thank you. Your question, question's been answered. No, it that, hasn't. You didn't answer my question. You I did answer question. your question. I said to you that it's part of the planning scheme already okay. so that people have access to services in their own areas. It's not about locking people away at all. It is about have, being able to access services in within a 10 minute or 20 minute neighbourhood from where you live. I understood that, but what I asked was, will this committee commit? I've, to, I've said to you, we're not locking anyone away. So that's it? That won't happen? There is nothing to indicate. It is in the planning scheme in terms of providing services to residents in the communities that they live. Have we got enough houses of the type we need? A fixed open, uh, urban growth boundary, a concentration around uh, building 10 minute neighbourhoods, about changing the mix of housing in many of the infill areas that we've got opportunities to do so, and then having a, a monitoring process every two years to make sure that we're on track. To having to produce some kind of a QR code, you know, just getting people used to that. Now what they're slamming us with is these 15 minute cities. It, make no mistake, it's not about your convenience. It's not that they want you to be able to, you know, uh, have, uh, all of these places that you need to get to very close um, and it's not about saving the planet either by the way the 15 minute cities they will have to have those before they can lock you down and that's what we're talking about here so in great britain some county already passed legislation they will be able to impose a climate lockdown that's the next step. That's what we're talking about. So in order to do that, they will have to have these 15 minute cities. Uh, the next step then, of course, will be um, you are only allowed to leave your immediate area for, let's say, two or three times a year. So but there's other people that may have more money and they can, they can actually buy your uh, passings off of you. So guess what? The poor people will be left in these 15 minute neighborhoods by the ones that are better off um, get to go wherever they want to go. So this is what we're talking about, you know. Um, look at Saudi Arabia, for instance. They're pulling up Naum City. Um, they call it the line. So this is like a structure in the middle of the desert, 200 kilometers long, 200 meters wide, 500 meters high, and it will house up to 9 million people. Oh, isn't that just brilliant? If I wanted to get total control of the people, that's exactly where and how I would house them. And then having them on a three, me uh, three meals a day prescription, well, guess what will happen if you do not do as you are told? They will probably cancel that. It's so easy. So that's what we're talking about. And uh, when you really take all of this together, there is no other way for me to, to actually say this. It will be a complete impoverishment and enslavement of all the people. research that we've been undertaking for the Bendigo Residential Development Strategy clearly indicates that we need about 1,000 new houses each year. We know that now more than 50% of people in Bendigo are living in two or one person households and yet about 90% of the housing stock is the traditional three, four bedroom house. Another thing that we're finding of course is that people are shifting to um, some of the fringe areas of Bendigo and they're finding that in those fringe areas they're, they're really heavily reliant upon their car, their motor car, to get to all the destinations they need for day-to-day -day living. So we've also seen a, a move of people shifting into some of the inner areas. We've had about 40% uh, of all new housing constructed in Bendigo over the last five years or so has been 
redevelopment inside the urban areas. So these are important trends to understand, to manage this, this change in the demography of Bendigo, the way in which people are living in Bendigo, and the way in which they perhaps in future will want to live. So I um, decided to do this video after watching um, James Laurie at the, at the Bendigo Council event that I put at the start. So yeah, well, well done to James and the rest of them that are going. It's, um, yeah, this is like this is a good movement that I completely support. I've kind of mentioned before that um, uh, we keep looking at the centralised power, um, but because it's a compartmentalised system in which there's a centralised power, you actually have no real say over what happens at the at the peak of the pyramid. But on every level, you're actually fighting the same thing. Um, you're coming up against the same force. So. If you want to take on the centralised globalist power, it's actually it's actually being implemented at local government and in the compartmentalised pyramid system that um, local council is the way this has been implemented. So I just want to take you through some of these Bendigo documents, which is um, pretty crazy. Um, I hope you can see this. If you can't see it, I'll just, um, just add it in. But... Um, so these are like I've spoken a lot about Benigo before, and now this is not a new um, <laughs> this is not a new plan. You know, this goes all the way back to after World War Two. I mean, it goes before that, but you know, it's documented before World War Two about this um, this globalist push and the Club of Rome and Agenda Twenty One and Paris Climate Accord and now Agenda 2030 and now the 10-minute city. So it's, it's all the same implementation of the same plan that goes all the way back to like people like Maurice Strong and all that sort of shit. But I don't need to give a history lesson of that, but we're at the stage now <laughs> that they're openly um, talking about, you know, these, so this uh, Greater Benigo Housing Strategy Issues and Opportunities 10-Minute Neighbourhoods, not even, not even the 20 or 15-minute, this is 10-minute. Uh, now, I've mentioned before in Bendigo, Bendigo, uh, for whatever reason, um, is steerheading this fucking agenda. And um, to implement these so-called 10-minute cities within Bendigo, um, which is, you know, it's a regional hub. It's not a it's not a big metropolis like fucking New York or Tokyo or um, Beijing or somewhere that's already kind of got the infrastructure to um, push these smart prison cities into place. And so it's really interesting that the, it's a regional centre um, that they're pushing this. And if you look, everything's running by these train lines. Now, I just want to point out the start. The, um, the fruition of this agenda of these 10-minute cities, which it goes back, David Icke called it the Hunger Games agenda. Um, you know, you can look at the the mapping that they did for Agenda 21 back in the 90s of America, it's basically um, that you are not going to, um, they only have certain cordons for human use, some for some use, and 99% of all land is for no human use. Um, you know, we all, we all know this agenda, but the fruition of this agenda is, is absolutely not going to play out. Now, what we're seeing um, I don't want to go too esoteric, but what we're seeing is these are either two; these are two different timelines or two different energies that are having this battle out, and people that are pushing, uh, um, not even the the driving of this agenda, but people that are pushing this agenda cannot see beyond this agenda, right? Um, and the timeline's been missed. There's no way this is going to be implemented. Benigo's plan is to have this agenda up till they wanted full. Um, Full net zero by 2030. Environment's strategy 2021 to 2026. They've, de they've done so many of these. They just keep um, amending them and doing new ones, right, and saying that it's their own initiative. But, like, have a look at some of this, right? I'll just go through some of them. So the first the first side is, like, goals by um, uh, 2026 targets, and then they've got 20, 2036 targets. So the 26 targets, no new gas connections, council buildings, 60% of council and small, medium size, small size owned and operated buildings transitioned off gas. Gas. Ninety percent of council owned buildings have solar system um, installed. Thirty five percent of light fleet is electric. Um, program to regenerate offsets established in partnership with North Central CMA. 
uh, more than 60% of council funds are invested with financial institutions. They do not lend to fossil fuel in industries, right? Again, this is talking Benny O Bank because it's one of their one of their stakeholders. But they've got here 40% of households and commercial businesses to have solar installed, no gas connections to new subdivisions, one um, zero carbon new development, and 20% of all, listen, this one, 20% of all passengers a passenger vehicle sold in Greater Bendigo to be electric or hybrid by 2026. Like this is only, there's only three years. Um, then around transport, 2026 targets, 20% 20 of all staff trips to work. So this is a council target. <laughs> they want all council staff trips to work to be do, done through active or shared public transport. But then go down to like these ones. Um, for the community, they want 10% of trips to be active transport and car sharing program to, in, to be installed. Now, this is even why they did Uber. Uber was put, like, set up by Silicon Valley, which again, it's like seed funded CIA because Uber and like um, Uber and um, what's the other one, like Airbnb, they're already set up for social credit system. It's already got a ranking system on there. It tracks you where, where you've gone. Um, yeah, but then listen to this one. Um, this one's pretty crazy because this kind of ties into the voice, what they're doing with the voice. Um, so 2026 targets for the community, communities to be aware of resources requiring food systems, 80% of um, early childhood education setting, settings, primary and secondary schools incorporate sustainable food system education into the curriculum. Well, it's the crickets, you will live in the pod, you will own nothing and you will be more happier. And then they want it 100% by, by the next target. But listen to this one, annual target area of land to plant and harvest set by traditional owners to be cheap. So within the next, um, you know, so, so many years, um, they want the annual target land and plant that you can plant and harvest to be set by traditional owners. This is perfect. They've already set up for the voice to win because they're going to use these little uh, the local tribes and aboriginal co-ops that have already already sold out to this agenda as well like if you know like um badak and jaja rung and bendigo um they sign on to all this shit with the council um i'd like to know what kickbacks they're getting but that's that's what they're going to do they're going to use the traditional owners but not so much the real elders but these aboriginal co-ops um to say where you can and can't do agriculture and where you can and can't build and then again, they've got it for their water goals as well. Two water, two waterway reserves are going to be co-managed by Jara and I can't pronounce the other one, Tanjugulung, a recent agency or whatever. So Jara, I think that's part of um, like uh, Jaja Rung. Um, yeah, so they're going to to me. It's like that's that's basically saying that they know the voice is coming in. Now, this is a radical plan, even compared to what the, the federal and state governments are pushing. They want, they want this in Benigo, full electronic vehicles by 2030, um, no carbon emissions from any um, any industry within Benigo, um, and all this to be done within the next six and a half years, which is it's absolutely not going to happen. Um, so I don't want this to be a scare tactic, but it, it's really just to call out these... Um, these councils and i'm telling you these these cancel these are the biggest crooks these are the absolute biggest crooks and um they do need to be jailed for this eventually and nothing will give me more pleasure than <laughs> seeing some of these bendigo councils locked up because what they're actually guilty of here is treason um these are not local initiatives these are coming from a centralized body that you can pick up from the un but you know they're coming further than that but if you can pick it up from the un um, and all these other treaties and stuff that we they've sold the people out to, right? And that people are going to realise when this shit's all said and done um, how fucked over we've been in Australia. Um, we are we are being robbed in this country to think that we have twenty what twenty eight million people or whatever on a fucking continent um, that we we should be producing everything here and. Um, and, you know, people are getting further and further into poverty. So, look, I just want to go through a couple of these. It's, it's super interesting. Now, I just want to point out, I've said this before, Bendigo was the first place in the world to have mandated smart meters. This came in around 2010, um, and they were installed 
rapidly. Um, and then a, a, a little bit more of the history is too, we've had things like there was a boxing event where they got rid of um, the so-called ring girls and there was a lesbian counsellor that said this is disgusting the way they're treating women, you know, this big fat lesbian counsellor. Nothing against lesbians, but, you know, she's having a go at <laughs> good-looking young women. Um, and, again, the council sponsored this event. So they sponsor the event and then they dictate. And so this is so – if you look at the the last time I saw the Benigo Council elections, every single one of them, even the conservative side, they all mentioned green, they all mentioned smart, they all mentioned equity, and they all mentioned equality. Um, it is 100% being taken over by UN Agenda 21. Um, I just want to point out some of these. So this is a, this is the map. This is the first map they got coverage of character control. So they use the word control. Now the light um, orange, I'll, you'll see this play out more as I go through some of the other stuff. Um, this is going to be the, the residential zones in Bendigo, and they want to start pushing for high density living in Bendigo. Which you know, this is it's not a new agenda. People we've known about this. Um, for decades. Anyway, so this is the Bendigo 10-minute neighbourhood. So the notion of a 10-minute neighbourhood is closely aligned with the residential development objectives. A 10-minute neighbourhood is a, is a neighbourhood where people can have access to their daily needs, workshops, blah, 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 cycle. Yeah, we all know that, right? Um, so these are the main things. People to have greater economic opportunity, people to spend less income and combine cost of housing and transport, minimise um, environmental impacts, promote healthy lifestyles, greater transport, right? Um, so this one, I think it's this one here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are just the stages. I'll, I'll put these documents in so people can go through it, um, in their own time. Um, so this is all coming under the housing strategy. So this is one that they're going to do around the former Colburn water site. So they're actually going to open up. Um, so-called crown land that has been used because there's quite a bit of it around Bendigo because of, um, because of the mining and stuff like that, there's been a lot of places that they haven't allowed residential development. Um, but this is some of um, what they were pro uh, proposing for um, high density living. So it says 10, do 10 dwellings per hectare at the bottom image is a 30 dwelling hectare. Um, there's another one near Simon's Dairy that they're going to build. Now, these are, <clears throat> these are some of the ones we see like here that they've already started to build around the CBD and Bendigo. Now, this started... Probably, I remember even when I was, I was still at high school, they started putting some of these in around the CBD. So that would have been early 2000s. This is like, you know, 20, 23 years ago. Um, and this is what they talk about, high density living. I'll show you when we get to the video later that one of the councillors speaks about um, the hint because this is, this is where it's going eventually when they collapse the economy, they'll dictate where you live. Um, and they're going to say because of... Um, um, your carbon emissions, um, you know, like my old house, I was a one person living in a three-bedroom house. I say that that's not equitable um, and your your carbon imprint's too big that you need to be, if you're a one person, you need to be in a one-person dwelling or minimum, at maximum two. Um, infield development of character. Okay, it's just talking about the structure of some of these buildings. Um, the character of the area should be used to prohibit development. Um, neighborhood character is not static, changes over time. Some areas will change to be more noticeable. There's a broader strategic implement implications that need to be considered to a compact urban form if is achieved. So they, they're actually calling these um compact cities. Now I just want to show you this this other document. This is really interesting. Um I hope you can see these, but if not, I'll um I'll edit them in. This one's wild. Uh, Greater Bendigo Residential Strategy Adopted Version. Now, this is first written up in 2014, and it's been um, it's been updated since. Um, so it, it talks about some of the statistics they got around Bendigo um, and the data of the growth. They're suggesting Bendigo is going to grow up to 200,000 within the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, it says here provide residential. The residential development needs of a 20 year forecast the city of Greater Bendigo up to 150,000 people and indicate where population growth is up to 200,000 people. Um, support residential development in Bendigo implementing government policy, not government policy, the UN policy. 
um, provide approximately 85% residential growth within the Bendigo CBD. This is what it's all about, provide approximately 85% residential growth within the CBD and 15% in small town. So that they want everyone living close to the centre, and I'll get to the map in a minute. Where um, they've actually split Bendigo up into certain quadrants of ten-minute cities, and I spoke about this before. That they've had documents up for Golden Square to be the centre of the smart city. Um, uh, that's been up for about ten years. That planning. Um, so strong support and provision of high-quality, well-designed, medium-density and residential residential development given the low levels of provision to this form of housing, this need, the needs of the ageing population and the fact that 50% of households compromise, listen to this, only one or two persons. And that proportion is a forecast to grow higher. So they're saying that we've got a, because they're pushing all this housing crisis now, we've got a housing crisis and these fucking selfish people have got four bedrooms and there's only two people living in the house. How, you know, how dare they? Um, continue to provide a plan, new residential development within the existing, okay, yeah, provide um, rezone areas for residential development within the UGB that are zoned farming low density. Re so rezone areas for residential housing that are in low density residential or, or incorrectly zoned where these areas are supported by infrastructure. So in other words, area that's not being used and low density of people that have actually got land because there's places like Ginnerton that are left out of this plan, which is just on the outskirts of Bendigo. Um, so they're saying here incorrectly zoned, right? What's this fucking mean? They're, they're pushing the 85% of people to live within the CBD and saying that some low den density areas are incorrectly zoned and they need to be uh, changed to resident residential planning of Bendigo. Um, okay, implementation. Prepare for Bendigo Greater Housing Strategy to identify the application and implementation of a suite of new residential zones in accordance with government policy requirements. Undertake an annual housing, listen this one, undertake an annual housing audit to monitor and supp the supply of residential development against demand and ensure that there are adequate supply of housing provided to meet Bendigo's demand. Now, they've also said they're going to start bringing in Ukrainian refugees, right? So, so they're going to do an audit, right? So they're telling So that what they're going to do is they're going to audit, um, and particularly if you're going to foreclose on your home, which a lot of people are going to in the next year, then you are not going to dictate where you're going to live. You're going to be put into um, these high-density housing. Um, prepare precinct structure planning for Morong, Heathcote, and Elmore. In order to accommodate the population growth of 150,000, projected 200,000 people, undertake forward planning to determine the suitability and areas of residential growth. And what do you know? This just comes in today. So Bendigo has a contract for <coughs> the Commonwealth Games in Victoria, and they're building new housing for the event. It says Bendigo Council eyes granny flat style game solution. Let's three, rethink granny flat style housing. As Benio Council says, Commonwealth Games organisers brace for accommodation shortages. Councillor Jenna Alden is watching closely as the government picks apart the results of the trial centred on secondary dwellings. She wants the state government to roll out permanent changes to planning rules and steam lines approval process on small granny flat and garden studio style buildings next to existing homes. It follows the trial of loosening planning, Bendigo's rules, and three other council areas. So, yeah, they're going to build a heap of um, these small apartment style complexes. And this is it ties into the Flora Hill Zone that they have set as one of the main precincts for the 10 minute cities, um, as well as more um, high density living. Okay, yeah. So, so get, look at these ones here. So, this is. This is um... They're planning. So the, the objective is a compact Bendigo. Compact. I, I think I might put this video on here and you could, um, this will make more sense.
Research that we've been undertaking for the Bendigo Residential Development Strategy clearly indicates that we need about 1,000 new houses each year. We know that now more than 50% of people in Bendigo are living in two or one person households and yet about 90% of the housing stock is the traditional three, four bedroom house. Another thing that we're finding of course is that people are shifting to um, some of the fringe areas of Bendigo and they're finding that in those fringe areas they're, they're really heavily reliant upon their car, their motor car, to get to all the destinations they need for day to day living. So we've also seen a, a move of people shifting into some of the inner areas. We've had about 40% uh, of all new housing constructed in Bendigo over the last five years or so has been redevelopment inside the urban areas. So these are important trends to understand, to manage this, this change in the demography of Bendigo, the way in which people are living in Bendigo, and the way in which they perhaps in future will want to live. So against that background, we've undertaken a, a comprehensive review of the residential strategy. We produced a residential strategy in 2004, which basically has panned out roughly as we imagined it. We designated areas for new development. We tried to promote the idea of redeveloping some of the older areas. But of course, this rate of growth has actually exceeded our expectations. And so the strategy is rapidly becoming out of date. So what we've done is over the last two years, we've reviewed all the data, we've had a look at the areas that are growing, we've looked at the capacity of Bendigo to grow. We can contain just about all the growth that we need to contain over the next 20 years inside the existing urban growth boundary. But that means bringing on new land, rezoning the land, allowing it to be redeveloped, perhaps ahead of the, space, the, the pace that we saw 10 years ago. Bendigo's development has been quite fragmented. Uh, we've often leapfrogged difficult areas. In some cases those were mining despoiled areas, other pieces generally of public land that had a bit of difficulty about developing them. So what we want to do is focus on some of those areas and provide new opportunities for housing. So we've encompassed this idea of what we call 10 minute neighbourhoods. That within 10 minutes of where you live, you should be able to access a basic range of services and facilities. But what we're finding is that some of the newer suburbs, yes, you can access facilities, but even kids have got to, are dependent upon their parents to drive them to these facilities. We want to make those new communities and, and retrofit some of the older communities so people can walk and cycle and they can get to those facilities easily and without depending upon a motor car. Now what we need to do is, and uh, each two years we'll be doing a state of the city housing report. We'll be examining what development has happened where, has it, is it in accordance with the strategy? Are we keeping pace with demand? Have we got enough houses of the type we need? A fixed open, uh, urban growth boundary, a concentration around uh, building 10 minute neighbourhoods, about changing the mix of housing in many of the infill areas that we've got opportunities to do so, and then having a, a monitoring process every two years to make sure that we're on track. So if you listen to what he said here, he's, um, he's alluding to um, and they've pushed this through many ways. You know, they push this culturally. This is why they, they want open. They've started doing open housing. This is why all the shows like The Block and stuff were promoted, op promoting open living in that for ages. And the Bendigo Education Plan from the early 2000s was they ripped down all the schools and built these new schools, which was open learning because it's all about the interconnectivity um, of devices. Again, like that's what I spoke about, this AI. Everything must be connected to the internet as much as they want the high density living, the the what they really want is these new form of buildings that um everything's smart. And that's why they've done the Benigo Gov Hub where they've they've put all these um different agencies into into one building because they because they're going to control where you can go and where you live. Um so um the outward growth and the, to avoid urban sprawl, they they don't want anyone living on the outskirts. They basically said that Bendigo has grown as far out as possible and that now it has to grow up, that they're not going to push it out anymore. Um, directing development into planned growth areas away from sensitive areas. Now, this is another thing. They started pushing uh, the Bendigo Council so, oh, it's about six six years ago that there was a, a huge amount of people getting hay fever and stuff, and they're saying it's these trees that are in the, <laughs> in the centre of Bendigo that you know, no one's had an issue with for a hundred years. These hundred-year-old trees, but all of a sudden now everyone's getting hay fever. 
and they they're speaking about when they talk about these green spaces um you know greenies would think they're going to plant trees everywhere on that and part of it is they're going to plant trees into these park areas but that the big trees actually interfere with the millimeter waves um that they want everything to communicate with the internet and 5g so this is what they're going to start removing a lot of these old trees and saying that they're not sustainable either they cause hay fever or whatever um or whatever there are so um there is a land um zone for urban use purposes that are suitable for development such as former mine at chum street so here we go they're talking so these there's a bit big mining um areas like around golden square um and even central bendigo that have been left due to mining so they're talking about planning to build on them because they they're, they're situated right in the city um Okay, directions. Maintain non-urban breaks with, within or on the edge. Um, connected Bendigo. A complete 10-minute neighbourhood ensures that residents can access some, not essentially all, their daily needs within a 10-minute walk. So I'll get to these points where they they show you where these area areas are. Promote higher density and diversity on sites to promote to that demonstrate high levels of accessibility and proximity to activities and centres of nodes. So I told you that they've already started doing their Gov Hub and notice it says centres and nodes. And if you go back what I said about the sentient world simulation that created this um, artificial earth, they refer to all the humans and as nodes and then clusters of nodes, um, clusters of nodes also, also as nodes, right? Um, and this is what this is. This is this is a smart grid um, that they're creating this synthetic overlay in a town where you're not a human, you're a node. You're um, you're a node on their system, and I think that's like a pretty that's a pretty catching um, word that they've used that, that they've used that node because it's exactly what they use in the sentient world simulation when they're talking about artificial intelligence. Right? You're just an energy source. Um, they're going to appoint a residential development facilitator to identify key development sites and get them market ready. Ongoing investment in, in sustainable transport and infrastructure. They're already so this is 2014. They're already speaking about Bendigo must go fully um, to smart cars, uh, electric cars by 2014. Healthy Bendigo. I'll skip that one. Now housing. Listen, this provide for a population 150 thousand. We've mentioned that before. Uh, there is a lack of diversity in housing choice with a sufficient mismatch between the housing stock and the needs of households. The quality of design of the building stock open space, see, again, open space, all the new houses are going to be open space living because they need the interconnectivity of devices and uh, the public domain is an important contrib contributor to livability. 15% of new housing occurs in small towns, rural areas. Support high quality well-designed, higher density and residential development, especially in accessible locations, such as the city centre, university precinct. So they're going to do this out in um, Golden Square. Oh, sorry, not Golden Square, Flory Hill. Prepared design guidelines of high-density housing, open space and public domain. To have 3,000 people living within one kilometre of the Bendigo Post Office. Now, I've mentioned before too, they brought in the uh, the drinking lockout rules. Um, it was like the mid 2000s, and it was all concocted. I've I've spoken to local police that said, yeah, it was all it was concocted um, by the media, and they started locking people up for a few months. They got in the media, said the Bendigo nightlife's out of control, and then they brought in lock the lockout rule, which basically destroyed all the nightlife in Bendigo. And there's basically like one, one maybe two clubs in Bendigo left open now. And one of the old clubs, the big clubs, is now uh, being built up as a residential um, big apartment block right in the middle. Actually, it's right next to the Bendigo post office. So this is how long this planning um, has occurred. And people saying, you know, fight against it. Well, it's a lot of it's um, been implemented, but again, it's not going to, to the fruition of what they want, uh, there's zero chance of this happening by 2030. Um, establish a process to capture information on the diversity of housing being built and the report that this as state of uh, annual housing report. All right. Now, check this one out. So this is a map. Um, 
residential growth framework of Bendigo. Now, the, if you can look at the dotted line bits, right, these are the 10-minute zones that they've um, – or it says integrated activity centre. These are going to be your key 10-minute zones. So there's one up here in Flora Hill near the university. Um, there's one in Kangaroo Flat. There's one in the Bendigo CBD, and then it comes out to another one in Golden Square that I've, I've been pointing out for about the last five years. So that's going to be the hub of the Bendigo Smart Bendigo Smart Grid and now 10-Minute City that they, they're um, going to open up as well, one at Epsom and one at Eagle Hawk. And then Morong to be its own cutoff one. It says Future Satellite Township because they've pushed a heap of growth out here um, and they're going to build all these new facilities out here. So, and the whole point is eventually that if you live in this zone out here, you don't come into the CBD, right, unless you're permitted for work or whatever other reason. Now, check out the rail system. Um, so the, these are the train stations. And then proposed and reopened train station. I won't say propo proposed. This, these are the ones that are going to open. So currently in Bendigo, all you have, you have the Kangaroo, Kangaroo Flat train station. This is just the train line that comes in from Melbourne. Um, and then the main Bendigo train station, and then there's another one at Eagle Hawk that goes out to um, Swan Hill, and that I believe, um, or Chuka, whatever. So there's three train stations in Bendigo. That's it. Um, so they're going to reopen these. They're going to there's they proposed a new train station here, around Big Hill, one at Golden Square, in the Smart Zone. Um, another one, this is a this is like the, the big highway that goes out to Echuca. So they've proposed one here around White Hills, another one for Epsom. And this is a huge, there's been a huge growth area probably the last 10, 15 years in Bendigo. So there's a lot of people live in this corridor. So they've put two train stations here. Um, another one on the way up to Eagle Hawk, this is probably about where I lived in um, along Eagle Hawk Road in um, California Gully. Um, and two out in Morong and then further out. So they're, they're proposing to build seven. <clears throat> Why on earth would you need seven? Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven new train stations on top of the three that are already there. So you're going to have 10 train stations in this tiny little regional town. Why would that be? It's because you, you're going to be locked out of your area. You will only live in these proposed little areas, such as Flory Hill, Bendigo, Kangaroo Flat, Epsom, Eagle Hawk. You will only be permitted. You'll have everything in your 10-minute city to live off that they'll give you. You're going to have high-density housing in your proposed area, and then you're going to have the only way that you can get anywhere outside the 10 in which you can walk and ride your bike is through the train network. So have a look at that. This has been this has been set up for such a long time, and James was asking the question: "You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna use these for control or for lockdowns?" Well, absolutely. That that is that is the whole proposed agenda. What they're going to do? But anyway, this is this is pretty wild. If you have a look at this, um, and this is why they were setting up all these smart meters um, for so long. Um, and you'll start to know all the all the new buildings that they've do, done in Bendigo. They're ripping down all the old buildings. They're building all new infrastructure. Uh, the Bendigo Bendigo Bank building, the new Gov Hub building, the Law Courts building. All of them are these green eco buildings, which are actually just designed for communication um, of this um, this wireless smart network, right? That everything's going to be monitored. So, pretty wild document that. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there, but look, I, I would like to um, would like to go through it a lot more. I only just had like had a read over it yesterday, but um, yeah, like I hundred percent support people going to these council meetings, and um, I just yeah, like if, if you're going if you're going to structure your questions, um, have a real good th look through these documents, have a real good think, um, in what you're going to ask them, and uh, in a respectful way. You don't even need to ask them. You just need to say, we are fucking well aware of this plan you sign on to. This is not a gov this is not a local um Bendigo initiative or whatever council area you're from. Um uh, and we're calling you out. And if you continue to implement this, you've said that you've had public um consultation. The public doesn't support this, but then if more people start writing in and just showing up, just call them out because they 
I mean, these pricks need to be in jail. It's, you know, we like to blame the, you know, the UN and, um, you know, these globalist bodies and fucking Soros and, you know, even our, you know, federal governments and that. But at the end of the day, the, as you go down the pyramid structure, the, the more responsibility actually falls on those at the bottom. And these local councillors, look, some of them may may not be aware of this, right? But um, but they're they're powerless because they've signed on to these things. Well, they can pull out. You don't, um, they don't need to be implementing this. And you know, like their day will come. They they either need to repent and stop this because this is a slave system coming in this smart grid. And again, it's not going to be implemented, not to um, not to its fruition anyway. It's going to be exciting to see it. Um, play out, but they, these people need to be fucking called out. Um, and you know, like they e even go to them, like with um, like Malcolm Roberts does with the climate data. It's bullshit. There is no, there is no global warming, right? There is no climate. There is no man-made climate change. And um, yeah, it's just that I, I think Bendigo Council is just one of the best examples. Um, of how they've done this over such a long period of time, and also their um, their relationship with China, and um, and bringing over Chinese students a long time ago to set up this smart infrastructure. And I actually remember I rang um, I rang one of the I can't remember it was some sort of um, outsourced transport company that was collecting data, and this was in 2019, um, and they were they were marking all the key highways right, and and getting data on all the traffic, how much traffic were coming in after I rang them. And also the contempt that we, when we went to the Benigo Council in 2019 multiple times to speak, speak about the smart grid and the 5G coming in, the, um, the dismissal and the, and the contempt that they spoke to us with and the Federal Minister Lisa Chesters that called us anti-vaxxers and flat earthers. This is in 2019. We, we, all we were doing was talking about uh, 5G and she called us anti-vaxxers then, which, which showed that, you know, this was a big part of what they knew was already coming in. Um, I don't think these councillors are that naive that they don't know with this planning. They must be absolutely fucking retarded um, if they don't know there's going to be lockdowns for this sort of stuff. But um, the other one too, I would like to suggest there was counterterrorism drills done in Bendigo. Um, so, so first of all, they they brought in the agents like Blair Cottrell um, for the United Patriots front, front fighting off with the left when they brought in the mosque in Benigo. This is all part of Agenda 21. They were creating this um, division. of uh, Benigo is, very, is actually a very um, conservative kind of old town, so it's it's wild that they push this LGBT stuff so hard through. But anyway, they, they run counterterrorism drills in Benigo, um, and I think the scenario was that there was like a, a bomb on one of the buses, right, too, and I know Benigo Bank's done... Um, been involved in certain other exercises and stuff like that too. So I I, I did believe for a long time that they were going to set up some sort of right winger that was going to attack the mosque or you know whatever it may be. So just I just putting that out there because once you once you say it, it's less likely to happen, um, and nothing would um, nothing would surprise me. And the other thing was it was um, the person that was running the counterterrorism operations was. Um, a guy that I've mentioned before, Tim Holding, that's um, that lives over in London, but was the former former um, emergency services minister, and he brought in um, a lot of this bullshit after he had meetings over in the State Department and as well as over in Israel. He, Tim Holding was a was a big player in helping set up all this counterterrorism legislation, which was actually to eventually move from the Muslim terrorist over to the right wing domestic terrorists, which they're going to start saying that people like us that are questioning this stuff and going to local council meetings, that you are a domestic terrorist. So don't be scared of that. Call them out on their bullshit. And um, I'll um, I'll get back and put up a bit more once I've got more detail about this. But, yeah, cheers. All right, bye.